The Messed Up Origins podcast is sponsored by Squarespace. We humans are so wrapped up in the problems of the modern world that it's easy to forget that we were once animals in the food chain fighting to survive. Other species developed sharper teeth, stronger muscle fibers, thicker skin, and camouflage to help them get by, but we became soft bodies in favor of leveling up our brains. Brains that allow us to see the world not only how it is, but also how it could be. Despite the progress we've made over the past few million years, these animalistic traits are still lurking deep in our DNA. It's frowned upon to incorporate them in civilized societies, but they still exist in their rawest form in the unconscious and ancient part of ourselves. As such, the mythology and folklore that we've been sharing with each other for thousands of years is riddled with examples where the line between human and animal is blurred both in the physical and metaphysical sense. From heroes like Hercules, whose inner animal was unleashed for a mere five minutes and caused him to murder his whole family, to Egyptian goddesses like Sekhmet. She normally takes the form of Hathor, a goddess of love and family, but when it was time for her to get revenge, her inner lioness came out and she massacred most of humanity. It seems to me that the lesson is, no matter how powerful you are, and no matter how much you've done with your life, you're always at risk of losing control to the chaos that exists inside you. And there's no single creature that reflects that lesson better than the werewolf. Werewolves have been stalking the human psyche for millennia. They're a staple of ancient myths and pop culture trends. But where exactly did the legends of werewolves come from? They had to start somewhere, right? So at what point in time did the werewolf make its debut in the mind of man? And why did the idea of men being cursed to transform into monsters every month resonate so deeply with our ancestors? Did they understand something about the human psyche that we don't? Or was it because they were already living that reality with women? Don't worry, I only have nine more of those jokes. So like most, if not all, of the folkloric creatures and stories we discuss on this channel, it's nearly impossible to find a single solitary origin point for werewolves. However, if you know where to look, you'll find some breadcrumbs we can follow. For starters, it's important to note that while wolf-men hybrids exist in a litany of cultures, not everyone calls them werewolves. In South America, they have the Loizon, in Mexico, there's the Nahual, and in France, they call it the Luyahu. So if we take that into consideration and expand our search beyond the use of werewolves specifically, the earliest mention of a person being transformed into a wolf shows up in writings a lot older than you'd expect. In fact, we can go all the way back to one of the oldest stories ever written, the Epic of Gilgamesh, which has been dated to around 2000 BC. It may not give us a detailed description of the werewolf curse or what the transformation entails, but we do get some juicy gossip about the first man-to-wolf transformation. During Gilgamesh's feud with Ishtar, the Mesopotamian goddess of war and love, she proposes marriage to him and he responds by listing every guy she ever banged. He says that one of her scorned lovers was a master shepherd who sacrificed one of his flock for her every day. But despite how wonderfully he treated her, she turned him into a wolf, and now his own dogs and shepherds chase him off his property. In other words, she turned his own craft, his own passion, against him. Full disclosure, not all experts agree about precisely what animal the shepherd was turned into. Like there's one translation where he's not a wolf, but a tiger. Regardless, it's likely this is the oldest story about a person being cursed and turned into an animal that we'll ever find. And while there may be some disagreements over what exact animal he was, there's another famous werewolf myth that leaves no room for debate. The story of Zeus and King Lycaon. To summarize, Lycaon was king of Arcadia, and he wanted to test if Zeus was really all-knowing. So he had his own son killed, chopped up, and cooked into a delicious meal. A succulent Chinese meal? No, like your typical tasty Greek dinner. Except it wasn't so typical. And when Zeus was served the horrendous dish, he flipped the table, murdered Lycaon's remaining sons with thunderbolts, and saved the worst punishment for the king himself. According to Ovid, Lycaon's arms became legs and his robes turned into shaggy hair. Yet, he was still Lycaon. The same grayness, the same fierce face, the same red eyes, a picture of bestial savagery. So based on this description, he wasn't just a wolf. He'd become a hybrid of man and beast. And while we don't know exactly how his story ended, it had quite the impact. 
After all, it's from Lycaon that we got our other term for werewolves, lycans. It's also where we got the term lycanthropy, defined as a form of madness involving the delusion of being an animal, usually a wolf, with correspondingly altered behavior. So Lycaon may have been the first true werewolf, but he certainly wasn't the last. The folklore surrounding them continued to evolve, and for a surprisingly long time, wolfmen were considered a real threat to human lives. But do you know what's not a real threat to human lives? Squarespace, who's kindly sponsoring this episode. We've almost made it through the first quarter of the new year, which means your 2023 goals should be well underway. Then again, maybe you're like me and have had some unexpected hiccups impede your progress. If that is the case, you have nothing to worry about because our friends at Squarespace are here to help. For the four of you who don't know, Squarespace has made a name for themselves by empowering creators like you and I, giving us the ability to design beautiful websites easily, efficiently, and affordably. They make the process so easy from step one with their huge library of award-winning templates, intuitive design tools, and the fact that you don't ever have have to download any software or patches. They also give creators access to marketing tools and analytics so we can make sure our website is running efficiently, as well as personalized customer support 24-7 for those rare occasions when it's not. So if you want to join me and the thousands in our community who've benefited from using Squarespace, go to squarespace.com slash John Solo to start your completely free trial. And when your site is ready for launch, use code John Solo to get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. In order to understand the full scope of mankind's relationship to the werewolf, we have to look closer at the name we gave the creature. Where did werewolf come from? Well, according to the online etymology dictionary, werewolf is a contraction of the old English words were, meaning man, and wolf, which you can probably figure out means balls. Kidding. It means wolf, but I wanted to make sure you were paying attention because this will get real confusing if you aren't. Now, according to etymologists, the earliest recorded instance of Anglo-Saxons using the term werewolf was around 1000 CE. That's around 3000 years after the Epic of Gilgamesh was transcribed, meaning that werewolves had been creeping around the human psyche for a long time at that point. The Archbishop of York, coincidentally named Wolfstan, or Wolfstone, was responsible for writing the first law code of King Canute, who ruled over England, Denmark, and Norway during the 11th century. And there's one specific law that uses the word werewolf, only he uses it in a weirdly religious sense, as a metaphor for Satan. Honestly, that's not saying much because Christians back then used Satan as a catch-all for anything and everything they didn't understand and were therefore frightened by including dancing. Regardless, it's interesting to hear it in context. Thus, the shepherds who must protect the people against this ravager of the people must be very vigilant and zealously cry out. These are the bishops and priests who must defend and protect the divine flock with wise teaching so that the mad, gluttonous werewolf does not rend nor bite too many of the divine flock. In other words, don't let your neighbor be lured in by the devil. And if you see some devil worship going on, go ahead and tattle. God loves a rat. Now, at first you might think him using werewolf as a metaphor for a deceiver and a tempter doesn't mean much, but you have to consider that he could have used any word in that spot and chose werewolf. Why? Well, to be honest, it might be because he liked the connection to his name, Wolfstan and I'm not even kidding. Apparently the guy was a teensy bit obsessed with wolves and even signed his letters as the Bishop Wolf. But if I were to hazard a guess, and to be clear, that's all this is, I would say it has something to do with the qualities that wolves are usually associated with. You see, up until industrialization and the rise of cities, wolves were a real menace across Europe and Asia, and packs of wolves were known to attack innocent people. I'm not talking about hunters who had gone deep into the wild either. Wolves would attack farms, schools, and even weddings if they were bold enough. As a result, by the Middle Ages, humans had been associating wolves with unsavory behavior for thousands of years. They were seen as violent, wild, and sneaky. And no joke, the Roman word for whore was lupa, which literally translates to she-wolf. 
You can't forget to factor in the church's desire to control the cultures they swallowed up though. Like when you look at the writings of a German monk who also lived in the 11th century named Conrad of Hearsaw, he actually tried to forbid the sharing of werewolf stories. Or as he put it, stories where a person loses their ability to reason after going through a transformation. His reason? Because only God had the power to change a person into an animal. So the suggestion that a mere mortal could use magic to mimic God's power was paramount to, say it with me, Satan worship. In other words, it's because the werewolf was a remnant of pagan religion, which they wanted to completely erase from the history of humanity. First, they tried to allegorize the creature, and when the new definition didn't take, they tried to ban people from talking about it entirely. Unfortunately for the church, this ban didn't stick. It's not like people rebelled and suddenly thought werewolves were a good thing, but they continued to see them as a danger to be on the lookout for. And a few hundred years later, the werewolf trials commenced. That's right. I know you've heard about the Salem witch trials, but did you know about the werewolf trials of Europe? They were a real thing. We actually have records dating back to the 14th century detailing accusations of werewolfism and confessions of it. Though it's worth noting that 9 out of 10 people who confessed were tortured until they did so. Torture makes you say the darndest things, doesn't it? The confession didn't save them any pain, though. It just delayed it, because almost every time someone admitted guilt, they were executed in a particularly brutal fashion. Like serial killer Peter Stump, who in the 1500s was accused of using his powers as a werewolf to murder and eat over a dozen people, including his own son and two pregnant women. Peter was stretched on the rack until he confessed his guilt, was subsequently strapped to the wheel and skinned alive, then all of his limbs were broken before his head was cut off and mounted on a pike. The weird thing about it is that when he was asked about the execution afterwards, Stump said it still wasn't as painful as watching Velma. I'm just kidding. He was dead, so he couldn't say that, but he probably would have. Werewolves have been written about for thousands of years in both fiction and nonfiction. And as you can imagine, there's been a number of unique portrayals over that time, from ancient myths to gothic novels to Hollywood blockbusters. Unfortunately, because there have been so many depictions, I can't possibly list all of them or adequately explain how each rendition was affected by its author and the time period it was created in. That being said, while there has been a ton of variation with werewolves over the past few millennia, there are some specific qualities that are more or less consistent in modern portrayals. And the reason those qualities became consistent is because of one film, Universal Studios' The Wolfman, released in 1941. A werewolf can be killed only with a silver bullet or a silver knife or a stick with a silver handle. We have uh is beaten by a werewolf and lives, becomes a werewolf himself. As we've discussed, the ancient depictions of werewolves more closely resembled straight up wolves. Gilgamesh's sheep herder was completely transformed into a wolf. King Lycaon's arms are described as turning into legs. The werewolves of Ossery were legendary Irish warriors who were believed to turn into wolves. But modern portrayals often show them standing upright and having muscular arms with hands, fingers, and clawed nails although they're likely hunched over and may get down on all fours when on the move. They obviously still have animalistic qualities, like a body that's covered with hair and fur, a jaw that swells in size, teeth that get bigger and sharper, but they usually retain some distinctly human traits. And it was Lon Chaney Jr.'s portrayal of the Wolfman in 1941 that planted this visual in the minds of the masses and allowed werewolves to make the social progress necessary to play on the local basketball team. Seriously though, it's no wonder that their transformations on screen look so agonizing. I think it's safe to say that if there's one experience more painful than childbirth, it's becoming a werewolf. Which reminds me, for whatever reason, it's very rare for werewolves to be women. Not impossible, in fact I did watch two movies with lady werewolves leading up to this, but I think in most people's heads, you should be limited to only one curse that comes once a month. Because in all the literature we looked at in our research, the werewolf was specifically male. Whether it's in cases of nonfiction, like King Canute's Law Codes, which referred to the werewolf as a he, or 12th century romances like Beast Glavre, where a man's evil wife curses him to become a wolf, and then he rips her face off. 
I doubt that anyone's going to agree with me on this, but I personally think that Penny looks a little bit like a werewolf. It might be her hair. Okay, maybe not a werewolf per se, but at the very least, she looks like a little fairy princess that was turned into a dog, doesn't she? Lauren thinks that Gunther looks more like a werewolf, but I don't know. I just don't see it. Anyway, we'll talk more about the process of becoming a werewolf in just a bit. But for now, let's go back to that once a month thing. Just like the vampires we discussed back in October, werewolves have some oddly specific strengths, weaknesses, and rituals. And in my opinion, their most famous or infamous quality is their connection to the nighttime. The Wolfman doesn't get all the credit for this one. While his transformations do take place at night, and there's even a catchy little rhyme about it, Even a man who is pure in heart and says his prayers by night may become a wolf when the wolf bang blooms and the autumn moon is bright. There are many other monsters from myth and folklore that are associated with the night because historically that's always been the most dangerous time for our species to be away from shelter. Between the low visibility and the pathetic disparity in muscle mass between us and virtually any animal we come across out there, our chances of surviving through a night in the wild are slim to none. But the werewolf's association with night is even more specific because their transformations are are synchronized with the lunar cycle. Now your gut instinct might think this connection an obvious one. Wolves are known for howling at the moon, therefore the moon brings the inner wolf out of the man. Case closed. And while it's totally possible that the perception of that phenomenon may have been what led to the wolves in the nighttime being connected in the minds of us humans, I think it's worth clarifying that wolves don't actually howl at the moon. They howl at each other for hunting, social, or even mating purposes. Admittedly though, wolves are nocturnal creatures, so a lot of this howling does take place when the moon is in the sky, so that was likely a contributing factor that led to the misunderstanding, as was the fact that wolves usually start their hunts in the evening, leading to the victims of wolf or werewolf attacks to be discovered in the morning. Now let me propose a hypothetical. You're a villager living in 1500s Europe and there's been a serious rise in werewolf attacks. How do you go about solving that problem? Do you A, stay in shelter until the werewolf devours all of your neighbors and hope he never picks up your scent, B, track the werewolf down and politely ask him to attack the village next door instead, or C, stab the werewolf in the jugular with the sharpest hunk of silver you can find? If you answered anything other than C, then I'm sorry, but you've been torn to shreds. It turns out the only way to kill a werewolf is with a weapon made of silver. A werewolf can be killed only with a silver bullet or a silver knife or a stick with a silver handle. Well, I shouldn't say only because there are always exceptions to these rules, but in the vast majority of legends, they're resistant to just about everything. They can still be hurt, and if you're lucky, the injuries they sustain might even carry over to their human form, but unless you can generate enough force to knock them off their feet, chances are they won't even flinch as you fire bullet after bullet into them. We aren't exactly sure when their vulnerability to silver developed, but it's interesting to note that other folklore creatures, like vampires, had the same weakness. Like what is it about silver that makes it the preferred precious metal? Why not gold or platinum? It's impossible to say for sure, but we think it's because silver wasn't quite as precious as those other metals, meaning that even the most average Joe could get his hands on some silver, be it utensils, coins, or buttons. Obviously, buttons would not be a very effective weapon, but you could melt them down to make silver bullets, or knit him a sweater that slowly poisons him over time. Your choice. Now you may have noticed my little hypothetical back there didn't include an option for curing the afflicted of their werewolfism. And the reason for that is there is no fucking cure. At least for traditional werewolfism. Once again, there's room for creative interpretation. Because there are fringe cases like the aforementioned werewolves of Ossery, a popular subject in English, Irish, and Norse works from the Middle Ages. They were descendants of a legendary hero whose name I have no chance of pronouncing right. Lay ni fe la? That's a complete shot in the dark. I just know that with Irish names, you ignore half the consonants, and the consonants you don't ignore don't sound anything like you'd expect. 
Anyway, that guy had the ability to transform into a wolf, and it was believed that his bloodline carried that power too. In reality, his wolfmen descendants were probably just bands of male warriors who lived in the wilderness and simply wore wolf pelts while raiding and pillaging. The point is, those guys could transform voluntarily, so they didn't need a cure. It's when the condition is a curse that it becomes an issue. If you pissed off the wrong person, like a god, by committing a crime against nature, drank rainwater from the footprint of a werewolf, were discovered using dark magic, or were left scarred by a werewolf attack, you could be transformed. Whoever is bitten by a werewolf and lives becomes a werewolf himself. And most of the time you were stuck with that curse until someone sent a few inches of silver into your heart or brain. Speaking of, you're starting to look a little hairy around the gills. If you don't mind, I'm gonna take my pure silver letter opener and... Good, you're finally awake. Sorry about stabbing you in the brain there. I may have overreacted, but the good news is I didn't hit anything important. Just your temporal lobe. Okay, so you might have some memory problems, but is that really anything new? Anyway, while you were unconscious, I learned that werewolves don't actually exist, which kind of blows my mind. Think about it. People have been telling stories about wolfmen hybrids and treated them as real threats for at least 3,000 years when there's never really been hard proof of their existence. Just hearsay and admissions from people whose bodies were broken in six different ways. Not the most reliable sources. And I know people in modern times tend to overestimate how dumb people of the past were. So some of you watching might be thinking, well, yeah, they lived 500 years ago, a thousand years ago. They didn't know shit about shit. But people didn't just tell stories about werewolves. They really believed in them, which makes me think that over the years, they must have seen or heard something that reaffirmed their beliefs that a man could be possessed by or transformed into a wolf. Let me give you an example of something they could have come across in the real world. Rabies. Symptoms of rabies include fever, confusion, excessive saliva, hallucinations, hyperactivity, and anxiety, all of which could make someone appear to be possessed by an animal if left untreated, which was the only option with rabies until the treatment was discovered in 1885. To make it more interesting, rabies is similar to the werewolf curse in that it's passed on through scratching and biting. There's also hypertrichosis, which comes in many forms, but simply put, is when an excessive amount of hair grows all over the body. Hypertrichosis is also sometimes called werewolf syndrome, which isn't the most sensitive moniker, but it proves the condition has been tied to the creature in people's minds for some time. We also can't forget about lycanthropy. Inspired by King Lycaon, lycanthropy is a mental illness where someone imagines themselves to be a wolf or another kind of animal. It's possible that the aforementioned murderer, Peter Stump, was suffering from lycanthropy when he killed and ate those people, or he was just an asshole. Just imagine yourself living in 1500s Europe, having heard stories about werewolves, and then encountering someone afflicted by any one of these illnesses or one of the raiders that wore wolf pelts that I mentioned earlier. You have no way to verify what it is you're seeing, so to make sense of the experience, your brain would reflexively label it as the monster that you heard stories about. Then you would tell someone else about your experience and swear on your life that it was a werewolf you saw because to you, it really was. And then they would pass your story on and also swear it was true because it came from a reliable source and the legend of the werewolf would be given just a little bit more credibility. So tell me, mere mortals, what are your thoughts on the messed up origins of werewolves? Were you surprised by anything you learned today? Do you still have any questions that I could answer in a future episode about the beasts? Let me know in a comment. And if you enjoyed this video, then I'd recommend you check out our episode on the messed up origins of vampires. Come on, you just learned about werewolves. Now you gotta complete the set. I'll see you all again next Thursday with a deep dive into Greek mythology and every weekday leading up to that with some brand new short form content that will blow your mind. Until then, my name is John Solo, and don't forget, John shot first.